Institutes is the head of the academic program. All right. <clears throat> Should we start? Yes. Well, well, uh, just give me a morning. minute, Dr. Russell. It's just live streaming. Okay, let, okay. let that stream begin and then we can. We also have uh, Des. Professor Hi. Des Kahal. Welcome to Des. Yep. Um, it's 112 okay. as of now. Are you ready to? Shanti is also here. Yes, yeah, Shanti. Welcome, Professor Shanti. Good to see you. Hello, Shanti. <laughs> uh, are we ready to start, Dr. Russell? Can I start yes. the recording? Yes, yes, please. Go ahead. Good. All right. Very good morning. Uh, uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. And, of course, in Australia, where I'm talking to you from, it's good night with Des Kyle and myself and a few others. Uh, we have a uh, welcome to the 44th webinar conference, international webinar conference uh, of the, uh, the Department of Education of the International Chair of Bioethics based at Melbourne, Australia, formerly the UNESCO Chair in Bioethics of the University of Haifa. But um, we, as all of you who might be joining um, um, now, we have been having these uh, webinars or these international uh, discussion for a lot from the time the pandemic started. And uh, wonderful areas, we've covered many different disciplines, many areas, and I'm delighted today to, um, to, bring, to, to bring to all of you the Bioethical Challenges for Physiotherapy Practice and Education in the Current COVID-19 Pandemic. I want to uh, bring uh, tell you that this is the third. We had two uh, uh, excellent um, uh, conferences, webinar conferences with the panel discussion covering the globe in physiotherapy last year, uh, where we had uh, deliberations on some of the major issues faced by um, uh, the discipline of physiotherapy in dealing with the COVID pandemic. We've traveled along now to almost 18 months with this pandemic and it will be important, it will be um, interesting to listen today um, to what we're going to hear and, and what we're going to discuss, deliberate. Um, and from 2021, we have the, we had, we have a, the, a series that has th uh, usually two to three short presentations from, uh, keynote presentations from um, uh, colleagues around the world. And that uh, acts as, 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 as a, sets, sets the scene as it were. And then we go on to the panel discussion. Today we have a, 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 a very um, distinguished panel of very senior physiotherapists, both from an academic perspective and from the uh, practice clinical um, perspective. So we're going to have a, 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 a um, great session. And before I go ahead, I, I, I will, I, and uh, I will ask the co-chair, Professor Mary Matthew, who has been um, moderating, co-chair has been moderating these 43 before this. Um, um, so I'm going to uh, ask her to, to welcome you. And, and also today we have Professor Colonel Derek D'Souza, who has been the chat moderator and coordinator of this program. Um, for forty-three of these great. programs. Okay, over to you, Mary, to get your. Thank you, uh, Dr. Russell, and welcome to uh, everyone. This is our forty-fourth 
webinar um, of our series. We started this when the COVID pandemic uh, happened and during the lockdown, it, this is what kept us all connected. We have done practically every discipline that we know of um, in this series. And um, uh, physiotherapy, um, we have done already too. So many of you are very familiar with um, uh, at, at least uh, with how we conduct these webinars and welcome to all of you uh, who are coming for the first time. Now, um, we have a very nice session today and uh, a lot of, uh, to all our uh, speakers and panelists, uh, to let you know that there are also students on um, this uh, webinar. So um, they will be looking to you for advice. And uh, probably um, if you uh, are able to manage uh, the questions in the chat box by yourself and it is directed to you, please feel free to um, uh, respond to the questions that I addressed uh, because we may not have time to take all the questions um, in this uh, two hour, hour session. So uh, before we continue, I'll, I'll ask uh, Dr. Derek to give the house rules. Dr. Derek, are you there? And may I request everyone to please not share your uh, videos and keep your uh, mics switched off other than our uh, panelists and speakers for today. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Mary. So um, welcome to everyone and it's good to be back and to see such a large number of an audience today. We've already crossed 335. So that is extremely encouraging. Uh, to all the students and other faculty who are here online, like Professor Mary said, you can please type your questions in the chat box. If possible, maybe you can also address them to one of our esteemed guests, panelists and speakers as well so that they can identify that this question has been put to them. If it is a general question, it's still fine. And again, like Professor Mary said, I can request our esteemed panelists and our speakers when they are not speaking or not on screen, they can go to the chat box and give their views and again, even if there is some additional reading information that you would like to share, that is also possible. So you can put in a link to an article or link to some guidelines that will help our faculty and our students as well. In addition, we also have a live stream of this webinar, which is happening parallel on YouTube. So I've already put it in the chat box. Please feel free to share it among your friends and later on, a complete recording of this webinar will also be available at that same link. So you can address it even later on. And if people have trouble joining the Zoom for any reason, they can always access this live or even later on on YouTube. If there are any doubts or problems, please put it in the chat box and we'll try and get back to you. So back to you, Dr. Mary, and all the best. Looking forward to a very interesting discussion this Sunday evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Derek. Uh, Dr. Russell, we can start. Thank the you. Session. Yeah, thank you, uh, Derek, and thank you, Mary. Um, okay, you know, what we're going to, we're going to have uh, three uh, uh, short uh, eight-minute presentations that will set the scene. Uh, and uh, before I introduce these distinguished uh, speakers. I also want to introduce uh, Professor uh, Neela Mishra, who is the head of the National Allied Health Bioethics Program. And she is the vice chancellor of uh, King's uh, University in uh, Karad in, in India. And we have also Dr. Um, Vishnu, Pu Vishnu Devi, who is the Dean of Academics, but she is the national, uh, uh, the uh, national, uh, head of the National Physiotherapy Bioethics Program of the International Chair in um, Bioethics. And also, this is the International Chair and the, and the World Medical Association Cooperating Center. Um, so, both of them will have a short address to you. And then we'll have 
Dr. Um, uh, John, uh, Professor John Stephen, who has been a panelist before, well known to all of us here. Uh, Dr. John Stephen, uh, Professor John Stephen is from the University of Sunderland in the United Kingdom. And he's going to present um, um, on interconnectivity, COVID challenges and opportunities in physiotherapy, education and practice. And he's going to, along with him, he'll be having uh, Neil, uh, who uh, I think Neil Kippert from Sunderland in the United Kingdom will be joining him in his presentation. And uh, the next uh, keynote presenter will be Professor Marco Peng from Hong Kong Polytechnic University. And uh, Professor Marco Peng is going to, uh, the title of his talk is going to be the delivery of physiotherapy clinical education during the pandemic. And we'll also have another very distinguished uh, speaker, um, Dr. Gopal Kumara Guru Paran, who is the professor of uh, in physiotherapy at the Savita uh, College of Physiotherapy, part of Savita University. He also, I think, has been part of uh, the Gulf Medical University before coming here. And his presentation is going to be challenges in patient care and education faced by Indian physiotherapy professionals and students during the COVID pandemic. Now, after this, we have, along with these uh, dis three distinguished speakers, we're going to have uh, a, a very distinguished pa global panel of very senior uh, physiotherapists who will join in for the panel discussion and these are going to be uh, from virtually covering uh, most of the world. And this is part of our solidarity that, and cooperation that this program has, uh, has built and has, is the foundation to right along from, from, um, uh, from the time we started. So I think I will come back before that um, uh, to introduce the panel we have uh, we have five the sixth panelist is not able to be there but five uh, countries will be rep having international panelists and i will take be delighted to introduce them uh, before we start it and mary professor mary matthew will be the very um, uh, uh, honorable moderator having moderated 43 of these programs international programs so can i ask can I start with asking uh, Professor Dr. Neela Mishra uh, as the head of, by, of the Allied Health? Can I ask you to say a few words before we open yes, this session? Sir. Thanks. Thank you very much, sir. A very good morning, or you can say very good evening, uh, and warm welcome to all of you. As in India, it is 6 p.m. Myself in the capacity of National Head of Bioethics for Allied Health Sciences, Dr. Neela Mishra, we see of this. Kara, Krishna Institute of Medical Sciences, Karad, Maharashtra. I'm here as a coordinator. I welcome all of you in this 44th webinar conference in collaboration with World Medical Association panel discussion. Your theme is very interesting. with bioethical challenges for physiotherapy practice and education in COVID-19 pandemic. I welcome Honorable Professor Dr. Russell, sir, Honorable Dr. Vith Prakash Mishra, sir, Professor Mary Matthew, madam, Professor Derek, sir, Dr. Pu Vishnu Devi and all respected presenters in this panel discussion. Now, ethics, it is a set of moral codes of conduct in day-to-day -day life. Similarly, bioethics provides regulation of manner and behavior with patients and human research subjects in healthcare profession. So during physiotherapy, what happens? The sessions, the patient and doctor relationship is very uh, very extensive and detailed, and hence the physiotherapists they have to follow the ethical framework as any other doctor while attending the patient and performing research on human subjects. Background physiotherapy plays a significant role in rehabilitation. So, however, 
the emergence of coronavirus disease 2019 this covid 19 has posed a big challenge to its practice especially regarding the level of contact with patients the covid 19 has raised a host of ethical challenges and mainly for physiotherapy is more the role of this tele rehabilitation is there this word tele rehabilitation is there however issues exist on how well it can bridge the gap of physical touch in physiotherapy conclusion of so many researches it is that tele rehabilitation is a necessary adaptation to ensure continued physiotherapy service delivery during the pandemic problems faced by physiotherapists are many and all of, of them the lack of ppe and very small issues are there scarcity of resources and inequity in accesses are frequently reported the tele rehabilitation is useful for assessment monitoring prevention intervention supervision education consultation and counseling it is comprising of video conferencing via internet phone calls virtual reality systems but there is low or moderate level evidence testing whether this tele rehabilitation is more effective or similarly effective way to provide rehabilitation however more quality studies are needed finally human touch has no replacement and we have to find alternative with these words with all the best wishes to the speakers i just give rest to my words thank you thank you dr neelam mishra i just wanted to uh, before i go for to uh, acknowledge uh, professor dr vet prakash mishra is the uh, the chan pro chancellor of uh, the data mega uh, university and he's also the head of the of the academic uh, program of the chair of uh, the chair in bioethics and of course des kahil who's also a professor des kahil from rmit melbourne belong he's the he de, he does the summary for the for these 44 or 43 conferences he's uh, from the melbourne unit of the uh, you know uh, of the international chain bioethics okay now let me uh, have uh, uh, introduce and have uh, Poo, dr pushnu devi say a few words before we get on to our presentations over to you dr devi pushnu devi good morning afternoon and evening everyone i am dr pushnu devi dean academic physiotherapy in university india and head of physiotherapy bioethics program of the international chair in bioethics i am delighted to coordinate this recurrent international panel discussion of the education department international chair in bioethics or formerly unesco chair in bioethics university of haifa the 44th webinar in 2021 series education in covid 19 pandemic distinguished panel of physiotherapists from all the continent on their encounters during covid 19 pandemic in their country in the pandemic physiotherapists under the allied health banner how and continue to play an important role from critical care to tele rehabilitation as key issues with necessary adaptations in physiotherapy clinical practice and education from the first covid wave the second covid wave has thrown us new bio- bioethical challenges in different form adapting to that physiotherapy education to enable the profession to overcome the new way of learning and teaching as academicians policies adopted by the government for the physiotherapy working in covid ward and in community setting and the government initiative towards the betterment of physio no and inculcate best ethical practice in both academic and clinical areas during the covid 19 across the region globally thank you everyone thank you dr vishnu devi thank you very much for that okay now we go on to our presentation and we're going to start with uh, professor john uh, stevens from um uh, you you united kingdom uh, over to you john and thank you very much neil. russell i'll just bring that up and i see we've got we've got neil on 
uh, now. Yeah, new results this is good. Are um, okay, I'll just get that dark screen up at the moment. Um, should be coming up now. I'll just bring that up to full screen and we'll make, make a start. Is that on to full screen now? Yes, it is. Lovely, thank you. Can I just say um, what a thrill it is to be here and have the opportunity to talk to you all um, with, with Neil, um, who's one of our students on the physiotherapy programme at the University of Sunderland. Obviously, um, this is a massive area and way beyond even the two hours that we've got. I'm sure we're just going to be able to scratch the surface, really, um, with our presentation and also with the two hours that we've got. And what Neil and I would like to do is provide a broad overview um, of our experience, certainly in terms of the challenges and opportunities in physiotherapy education and practice um, within the, the UK. Um, and raise some points, hopefully, that will stimulate discussion. Um, I say we can't hope to cover everything. As you'll see from the title slide there, Interconnectivity, COVID Challenges and Opportunities in Physiotherapy, Education and Practice. Um, this has been put together by Neil and myself, but also a clinical colleague who works in critical care at Sunderland Royal Hospital. In terms of the background, um, I think what has been highlighted across the past 18 uh, months for us, certainly, is this notion of interconnectivity and interdependence, um, not just within physiotherapy, but across all healthcare professions and all aspects of society. And the term which keeps cropping up, certainly in the UK, is that we are living in unprecedented times. You know, certainly there's been nothing like this. And Sadly, this has come at great human cost. Um, within the UK, there are uh, 129,000 deaths um, uh, accorded to COVID. And worldwide, I believe this is now at 4.14 million. But as well as the cost, this has also been a time within the physiotherapy profession for great resilience and also creativity and innovation. And of particular interest, I think, has been the relationship between evidence and evidence-based practice and values and values-based practice and linked very much into the notion of bioethics. And how we've addressed this is to look at the challenges and opportunities and place them within common themes, which are represented there in the diagram on the right-hand side of the um, slide. And so I feel across the last 18 months within physiotherapy, all the therapists that I've spoken to, bits of evidence that I've seen so far is really about working with uncertainty. It's about working at a period where rapid change um, is very much the norm and widespread. But the big thing certainly within the UK that has highlighted is inequality across society. And that's been reflected in that central relationship there of or central theme of equity, diversity and inclusion has seen that inequality played out and um, within areas such as critical care um, and emergency care, long term conditions and rehabilitation. So we've seen um, the advent of a new condition, a new long term condition in long COVID, um, which is a great challenge for our profession. We've actually also seen challenges and opportunities around resource and capacity in terms of how we use equipment and space within physiotherapy practice with a huge impact on workloads and work patterns uh, within the profession, how people work, the teams that they work within, which in turn has had a massive impact on the health and well-being, not just of the general population, but of physiotherapists and healthcare professionals. And as highlighted earlier on, there is this big push now in terms of an emergent evidence base around uh, COVID, which has been rapid, you know, the, the advent and probably certainly the big success story in the UK has been that of the vaccination programme, um, but also policies, not just government policy, 
but also those of our professional regulatory bodies, which is the Health and Care Professions Council, um, there at the bottom of the slide, and particularly our professional body, the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy. And I think one of the key areas where there has been massive change has been in information technology. And this has both been within practice and within education. So we've seen the rapid acceleration of remote learning when it comes to education, students' experience of remote um, placements um, within the UK has been a feature, but also um, within areas such as rehabilitation, cardiac rehabilitation, pulmonary rehabilitation, and also musculoskeletal services, remote therapies where people have been able to connect with um, patients um, to continue treatment. So massive impact on individuals learning and continuing professional development. And to highlight this, certainly from a student's perspective, I'm now gonna pass over to Neil to talk for a couple of minutes um, before I return to conclude um, on the student experience. Neil. I think you must be on mute, Neil. Is he there? Neil, can you hear us? Okay, Neil, are you there? Oh, Neil's there, yes. Neil, you're on mute. Can you unmute, Neil? Oh, bottom right, yes. bottom left. At the top, Neil, there should be a panel. Yes, there go you. ahead. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, you're, you're okay. You've got it now. I'm okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it wasn't allowed to unmute it. Sorry about that. No, you had dropped out. That's why. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's now okay. you'll be able to manage okay. my apologies. Please go ahead. Yeah, so obviously I'm here just to give a little student perspective on me time out on placement during COVID. Um, so obviously social distancing has required many of the health services to utilise telephone and video assessment um, in order to continue with healthcare provision. Uh, but obviously that brings up a lot of challenges and opportunities um, for, the, for me as a student and for physio in general. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about my actual personal experience when I was out there. Uh, so as a student, when I went out on placement, um, I understandably had concerns about my learning and development um, and how that might be impacted and limited by um, remote working and remote learning. Uh, and two questions like, I mainly asked myself was, how do I practice my observation, palpation and manual therapies if I'm not actually seeing patients face to face, which I think as a physiotherapist are quite an important part of the role. Um, and the second question was, is it actually possible to deliver safe and effective quality patient care um, over the phone? Uh, so whilst on placement, I found like my first concern was actually quite valid. I didn't get a lot of opportunities to do a lot of manual therapy to observe patients um, to get my hands on them. Uh, and other than a lot of patients I saw who had a lot of neck and back issues, uh, I rarely had the opportunity to assess or treat. Um, in fact, while I was there, I never treat a single wrist and elbow. I never treat any hands. I never treat any ankles because those patients were seen on the telephone first and sort of given exercises. So they never actually came in for a face-to-face -face assessment. So I feel like I missed out on those sort of skills, which I feel like are very useful for in the future. Um, and then also there's like a lot of communication problems. Obviously, like you saw earlier, I couldn't unmute my microphone. <laughs> um, and that type of thing can happen uh, when you're on placement as well. Um, so specifically like there's a, patients who have hearing difficulties, um, patients who maybe English wasn't their first language. It was a lot more difficult to communicate for myself and for them. Um, and I feel like those sort of patients who waited many weeks to get a phone call and then not to be able to be actually understood and heard 
then have to wait another five, six, seven weeks to actually get a face to face. So I always felt like they weren't receiving the quality of health care and were at more of a disadvantage than, than others. Um, and obviously communications further impacted them because, because patients have been waiting so long and a lot of them don't want a phone call or a video conference. They want to be seen face to face. You're dealing with more aggressive patients and more irate patients. Um, so you haven't learned to deal with those, like those sort of issues and sort of um, learn how to deal with confrontation. So that was actually a skill I learned. That was an opportunity because of video conferencing and phone assessments that actually I developed that I wasn't expecting to develop. Um, but I was also worried whether patients um, fully understood instructions over the phone. So if I'm giving advice or educating them about a condition they have, um, did they actually understand what I told them? Um, so sp specifically exercise prescription. If I gave someone exercise over the phone, do I know when they go and do it, do they understand how to do it safely? Uh, is the technique correct, correct so that they're actually getting the benefits from it? So if I was to see them in person, I would have been able to watch them demonstrate that. Um, so that's another little issue with doing that over the phone. Um, and just got a little note here. So like overall, I felt with personal development, um, although I did miss out on hands-on skills, I was able to develop communication skills and learned how to handle confrontation. Um, if remote work and does remain post-COVID, I, I, I feel I develop relevant clinical skills. However, it, it depends on whether um, clinicians, patients, and all stakeholders involved, including students like myself, if we feel remote work and has a role in future practice, otherwise some of the skills I learned might not necessarily be taken forward. Um, Indeed, that's, that's one of the areas that Neil's taken forward in his research project um, over, the, over the coming year. So thanks for that, Neil. That's been excellent because I think it highlights um, that area that Neil's um, highlighted, a big shift in professional identity or a continuing shift in professional identity for the profession. A lot of implications for leadership, particularly in terms of change, you know, and leadership right from individuals um, facilitating their own change to working with other people and facilitating change and very much a different type of collaboration and team working, different types of emergent teams. And I'd just like to finish really by, um, this is a picture of my grandson and really a celebration of uh, physiotherapy. I think across the world, the role of physiotherapy is to assess and facilitate movement. And just as you've got a little boy there, um, his uh, great joy in movement is to run up a grassy bank or similar structure and roll back down with a big smile on his face. I think that's really the purpose of physiotherapy globally. Really, it's about a celebration of the joy of movement in terms of how we facilitate movement from a microscopic level, i.e. influencing gases exchange, perhaps within critical care and so proning and things like that, which have kind of come to more prominence um, through to how people move around in society. And on that note, I'll finish there are, on the slides. I'll upload them. There are a, a few useful resources that um, people can make use of. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Neil. Dr. Russell, you're muted. Sorry. Thank you, John, for uh, yeah, that uh, excellent presentation to set the scene to start our program off. I'm now going to uh, ask uh, uh, Professor Marco Peng from Hong Kong uh, he's going to bring in from the Hong Kong Polytechnic University the delivery of physiotherapy clinical education during the pandemic. Yes, I hope um, you can see the slides okay. And um, yes, so first of all, thank you very much for your introduction and inviting me to um, uh, share some of our experiences in delivery of physiotherapy clinical education during the COVID-19 pandemic. And just uh, some special acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge uh, Mr. Raymond Lowe and Alex Wu for helping me put together this presentation. 
And in Hong Kong, we have experienced four waves of COVID-19. It really started in January, 2020. And in March, 2020, we experienced the second wave. And then in July, third wave, which is really bad. And then again, in December, um, we experienced the fourth wave. And that has affected uh, our clinical placements a lot, especially the third wave. Just want to give you some background information on how our clinical placements are delivered uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, in the hospital settings, uh, the typical student to supervisor ratio is six to one. Okay, so this is our model. And in community-based settings like in NGOs or private sector, this student to supervisor ratio is, is lower than that. But in hospital settings, it's six to one. And the clinical placements were suspended during the worst pandemic period. Okay. Um, so basically from late January to mid-June 2020, um, the clinical placements were suspended. And again, starting in mid-July. And at that point in time, we thought, okay, so the, tem the pandemic is going to be, you know, sticking around for quite some time. So it was decided that the clinical placements cannot be suspended forever. So we came up with alternative ways of delivering clinical education. And so we, we came up with this alternative solution is what we call blended or hybrid mode of clinical placement, which was initiated in late July, 2020. It lasted approximately four to five weeks. And what that really means is that the clinical supervisor, you know, um, they were still on site to deliver uh, this hybrid clinical education. But the students uh, attended the, these um, online sessions in their own place. So they didn't have to go to the hospital. Okay, So they attended the online sessions um, in their own place. And in terms of the content of these clinical placements, it's a combination of case study discussions plus some tele-rehabilitation. So the case studies component, and what they did was uh, real case discussion with the clinical supervisor using you know, the Zoom platform. And on a typical day, they, you know, they, they have like three to five cases, okay? And these are, you know, for each real case, um, the students were involved in like uh, interpretation of assessment findings. Um, they were required to do some treatment planning, a lot of clinical reasoning and so on. And the students were given homework to prepare for a case discussion and separate rubrics were also developed for assessment of performance in the case discussion. So it was something new, um, I have to say, it, it really took time for the clinical supervisors themselves to get adjusted to this uh, new system. And you know, same for the students as well. And tele-rehabilitation, yes, um, there's a tele-rehabilitation component and the students got to assess and treat patients using the online platform. So through the online platform, they actually got to see uh, the patients, the real patients, okay? And overall, this so-called hybrid clinical education um, um, constitutes no more than 20% of the total clinical education in the curriculum. So we, we had a, you know, this, some discussion with the licensing body. We wanna make sure um, our graduates, you know, despite uh, the use of this clinic um, hybrid clinical education, they remain competent, you know, by the time they graduate. And so there, there was some discussion on, you know, how much hybrid clinical education can be implemented. And, and, and fortunately, uh, the pandemic, um, after four to five weeks, has subsided. So now we, we are sort of back to the more normal, typical face-to-face -face clinical placements. 
And in terms of the feedback from the clinical supervisors, and one of the advantages of using this hybrid form is the students and the clinical supervisors actually got to you know, engage in more in-depth patient case discussion than conventional face-to-face -face placements. You know, this is one of the feedback that we received from the clinical educators. Um, but the disadvantage is that you know, the clinical supervisors actually got to spend a lot of time preparing the material for case discussions. In particular, uh, the compilation of patient assessment reports and they, they want to make, because you know, these sessions were conducted um, online. So we want they, you know, the clinical supervisors want to make sure they were able to remove all the information that can reveal the patient's identity, okay, before showing it to the students um, on the online platform. Okay. So that that took a lot of work. And um, they also you know, spend a lot of time converting everything to digital format. So that's sort of extra work uh, for the clinical supervisors. And of course, there were some technical problems um, with the online platform. So these are some of the disadvantages. And feedback from the students, we, um, we did some focus group interviews with the students as well. Um, we, we try to obtain feedback from the students on these different aspects, you know, how, how well um, did the university prepare for the students to go through this hybrid clinical placement? Um, students on preparation, uh, the content of the clinical placement itself, um, the supervision provided by the clinical educator and the perceived learning outcomes. And you know, for these different categories overall, the results were um, very positive. You know, the feedback from the students. Um, so in Hong Kong right now, um, the pandemic has subsided um, to a large extent. We have had almost like no cases for like a few weeks. Okay, so that that's good. Um, but still, uh, even when we have like the face-to-face -face clinical placements, um, the students still cannot have access to those wards that are considered higher risk, like the high dependency unit. And suctioning, um, students are not allowed to perform suctioning at this point. So the graduates, you know, if they, you know, these graduates later on, you know, when they enter the workforce, they have to receive on the job training for that particular skill. Um, to conclude, yes, we face major challenges in terms of the delivery of clinical education, uh, because all of a sudden we, we were <laughs> faced with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, but we use digital, um, you know, the online platform, to tackle the challenges. And but we need to also acknowledge the strengths and the limitations of you know, online teaching and learning. And yeah, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Marco Peng. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, bringing up, uh, uh, presenting the from uh, Hong Kong, China, the perspective of what, what's going on there. And um, um, we'll now move to our last presentation, which is going to be uh, by the way, distinguished Dr. Gopal Kumaraguru Parant, who is from Savita uh, University or the Savita College of Physiotherapy. And I think um, now we had uh, Hong Kong, we had uh, um, United Kingdom, and we're going to hear about the challenges in patient care and education faced by the Indian physiotherapy professionals and students during this pandemic. So over to you, Dr. Gopal. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I'd like to share my screen. Yes, yeah, sure. Hope I can able to see. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Russell D'Souza and uh, Professor uh, Derek D'Souza and all the organizing team for uh, giving me the opportunity to participate in 44th International Webinar Conference. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, deliver a short lecture about uh, challenges in patient care and education faced by Indian physiotherapy professional students during COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, 
Yes, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, three major objectives, uh, the core responsibilities of physical therapist and student and patient care during COVID-19 and uh, the ethical challenges faced by them during COVID-19 pandemic and some of the ethical issues identified by them during clinical practice and education during COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, India has approximately a 55,000 registered physical therapists addressing large population or most nearly 138 crore population. As per the WHO guidelines, that, that, that ratio is not sufficient, but still we are uh, managing to deliver uh, you know, quality care for large population. In this juncture, I would like to acknowledge the physical therapists who were involved in clinical practice. They played a vital role in providing uh, you know, quality PT management for patients admitted with uh, either confirmed or suspected COVID symptoms during the you know, pandemic. Also, I would like to extend uh, the acknowledgement uh, uh, to the PT interns and postgraduates. They also played a vital role in assisting the clinical therapist and also undergraduate students, they also involved uh, you know, in, uh, in supportive uh, role to the clinical therapist and uh, they were detailed by the professionals during COVID-19 time. Uh, we'll move on to the, the core responsibilities of the physical therapist and students in patient care. Uh, first, uh, the, the, they have a responsibility to ensure the current guidance of practice. Uh, because uh, during COVID pandemic, there is no separate guidelines or uh, you know protocol provided to the physical therapist to follow. But uh, during 2020 March, uh, WHO jointly with the Australian Physical Therapy Association, Canadian, Canadian Physical Therapy Association, they published a paper in elsewhere addressing uh, you know acute and moderate uh, uh, patients with COVID symptoms. Okay, that was the protocol uh, we got it, but still. That was the huge responsibility to, to ensure the current guidance of practice. And uh, that includes prevent uh, minimize exposure, social distancing and maintain rehabilitation facilities for home and community care because during uh, COVID pandemic, uh, you know, national-wise lockdown and also state-based lockdown that was extended more than a uh, you know, couple of months. Uh, during that time, all the, the outpatient rehabilitation services was completely closed. But uh, that was the major uh, responsibility for the clinical therapist to provide, uh, you know, rehabilitation care for home and community uh, patients and managing the workload because, you know, uh, uh, during first and second wave, uh, there is a huge difference in number of patients admitted in the hospital. It was extended from 100,000 to 400,000 during May 2020 and 2021. So the patients pulled, uh, you know, largely to the hospital and admitted. And physiotherapy was emphasized more on the phase two. So managing workflow, one of the major responsibility. Get educated about the strategies, procedures, the scenarios during medical emergency. Most of the, you know, almost all the physical therapists those are working in clinical side, they, they got certified with the BLS, but uh, it was emphasized to go for ACLS certification also because we can't able to predict the same medical emergency will happen every time. And uh, that was the big responsibility to make them understand what kind of a scenario or algorithm they're following, at least uh, to understand. So these are the, the responsibilities in the, in the clinical side and the core responsibilities of the academic faculties during, uh, you know, COVID pandemic. Uh, actually, traditionally, we have, uh, you know, online, uh, not online classes, uh, classroom teaching. We move completely from classroom teaching to online. So the current curriculum and syllabi was, you know, modified. So that is the major responsibility to modify the syllabi and also to curriculum to match online mode of uh, delivery and also selecting the appropriate uh, educational methods and medium for online teaching so that also one of the major responsibility those some colleges have a you know a learning management system lms system like a moodle platform but still few colleges so you know they they, they are uh, you know struggling to adapt uh, appropriate educational methods for online teaching and uh, finding new method for teaching uh, demonstration and clinical training that was the big uh, responsibility because uh, once we move to the online mode the demonstration and uh, clinical teaching was the big challenge and also we just uh, you know are finding a new method uh, i will explain later slide and uh, assessment and evaluation for written and practical examination in online so that also one of the major responsibility we found during covid 19 pandemic uh, 
We will move on to the challenges uh, in physical therapy practice during COVID-19 pandemic, uh, particularly during physical therapy practice, providing home-based and community-based rehabilitation services was the biggest challenge because many patients, those who need uh, pain management or palliative care, they can't able to access due to, you know, public transport and all the facilities was completely stopped, uh, you know, almost an early more than six months. So coming to the OPD and accessing uh, private independent uh, clinics, okay, that was uh, completely suspended during particular time. So that was the biggest challenge. So we adopted, uh, you know, tele-rehabilitation, contacting the patient through telephone and addressing their queries and, uh, you know, progressing the exercises, whatever. And delivery of outpatient physiotherapy services, one of the, you know, factor that also was a big challenge because uh, more than uh, four or five months during Peak time, March to May 2020 and 21, completely the outpatient rehabilitation services was completely closed. Okay, it's as per the guidelines of our local government and also WHO to minimize the patient contact. So those patients also included in the tele rehabilitation, managing large volume of patients. Yeah, early slide I, I was uh, you know explaining the patient uh, the the positive cases was risen from 100,000 to 400,000 during second wave. So managing the large volume of patients during second week was the biggest challenge it was identified and managing the workload in the emergency department. Uh, many clinical therapists, they, they worked beyond the, the given time, almost 12 hours per day. And it was uh, you know managed with uh, one week of uh, patient care and one week uh, compulsory quarantine was given for those complete the therapist and uh, before vaccination that was followed after vaccination we trying to we try to match up uh, you know the, the disparity of the workload and uh, uh, i also want to address uh, generating revenues for independent physical therapy clinics and centers so not only uh, generating patients or addressing patient needs but also to run the independent physiotherapy clinic was interrupted almost uh, more than one year uh, this kind of smaller clinic was completely closed and uh, that also one of the biggest challenge in the clinical practice involving student force and patient care during covid 19 pandemic uh, you know uh, the the icm or indian council for medical research advised to enroll the student for uh, patient care during 19 pandemic with vaccination and many states in india vaccination was not adequately provided for the student community so that was the big challenge to enroll the student force in patient care during lockdown so these are all uh, challenges in uh, physical therapy practice uh, i would like to explain the challenges in delivering physical therapy education uh, as we discussed uh, we moved on to classroom teaching in online in India, approximately 300, 339 colleges, 82% private and rest either government or mixed. Okay, so most of the colleges adopted new curriculum like competency based or either uh, the like uh, you know traditional curriculum. Some of the colleges running its traditional curriculum. Uh, some of the faculty doesn't uh, you know uh, doesn't aware of like uh, which uh, uh, online method of delivery is more suitable for online uh, teaching so sensitizing the faculty and providing lecture and demonstration sessions with online resources was the big challenge initially we have conducted adequate uh, webinar series and faculty development program to you know impart knowledge of the faculty to adapt uh, such kind of facility and uh, conducting clinical education and research for postgraduate students and uh, the, the curriculum itself, uh, you know, the main component in the postgraduate curriculum is clinical research. So during COVID-19 pandemic, uh, postgraduate students particularly, they suffered uh, without uh, getting adequate number of samples and patient, uh, you know, contact for uh, conducting experimental study. Okay, they have to submit a clinical research project at the end of the year. So that was the big challenge uh, during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So some of the students switched our experimental study to you know systematic analysis or uh, such kind of research. Developing the clinical skills in simulated experience that also identified as a big challenge. Uh, clinical skills was uh, you know uh, we we demonstrated through some of the colleges or many of the colleges they have a clinical skills department with use of mannequin. We used to uh, demonstrate with uh, human models or simulated models. Most of the physiotherapy uh, techniques are hands-on. That was replaced with uh, demonstrate through the mannequin 
and we just upload the video for uh, you know making the student to understand what kind of clinical skills they have to develop and also the examinations OSCE and OSPE so that uh, was uh, very difficult to conduct uh, through online mode so the challenge is how uh, how to conduct online like uh, we just adopted uh, simulated cases clinical scenarios like uh, context based a type mcqs and the uh, clinical scenarios and through that uh, we, we we just uh, assess the high level cognitive and psychomotor ability of the students and uh, they finally monitoring the authenticity of student participation during online classes examination was a big challenge as per the attendance, uh, it shows uh, 80 to 100 percent of uh, participation, but uh, the, the genuity of student participation was the big challenge, monitoring of the authenticity. So these are all, uh, you know, the challenges uh, faced by uh, clinical and academic side during COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to share some of the ethical issues that was identified during COVID-19 pandemic in clinical education and patient care. Uh, particularly, like uh, not, uh, I'm not going to generalize, but uh, uh, some of the universities and colleges they made a mandate clinical posting for students in managing patient with identified COVID symptoms. So this was uh, due to lack of uh, vaccination and also uh, fear of vaccination. During uh, you know vaccination was introduced, a lot of uh, myth uh, developed in India, and uh, due to that, uh, student voluntarily. Uh, not accepted in many numbers, so they made it mandate. So autonomy was compromised in some areas and non maleficence Some places, uh, COVID-19 guidelines not properly followed. Through social media, many started uh, advertising traditional therapy to manage respiratory symptoms and also normal COVID symptoms. So common public, those who can't able to access the hospital, they started following the traditional therapy and you know they just started practicing to manage uh, mild and moderate symptoms. So this may lead to like a risk of harm. So that also one of the ethical issues uh, and uh, justice uh, during lockdown provision of adequate physiotherapy services for all patient community, particularly those who need pain management and palliative care was not met properly due to lack of uh, transport services. And also during lockdown, the outpatient clinics and also independent uh, rehab in centers, everything was closed. So these are all uh, uh, leads to you know, lack of uh, justifiable care for all patient community. So these, uh, these are the, some of the ethical issues we have identified. Uh, I will conclude uh, from here. Uh, thank you for uh, listening patiently. And uh, you can contact me in my email gkgroupprint.gmail.com. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gopal. Thank you very much for your uh, overview on how uh, uh, what happened in India. So we had a, a overview of United Kingdom, India, and of course Hong Kong, China. Now I'm going to move to the next uh, part, part of this program, which is of course the the discussion moderated by the uh, distinguished Professor Mary Matthew. Now. Well, to, uh, uh, along with these uh, uh, distinguished speakers, we're going to add now, uh, I have uh, Dr. Praveen Kumar, uh, who is uh, the Dean of the College of Health Sciences from the Gulf Medical University in Ajman. So he joins us uh, representing, or at least uh, from the uh, Middle East uh, region, and I'm also then delighted to introduce to you Dr. Alison Alvis de Silva, who's um, a physiotherapy, for a specialist physiotherapy center in, in, um, uh, from the Nova Star Hospital in Sao Paulo in Brazil. And he is particularly uh, in looking at respiratory care, which is, of course, an important part of the managing of COVID. Um, and uh, I'll then move on from um, Brazil to uh, right on top to Dr. Uh, Albode, Albode from um, Edmonton in Canada, uh, who is a, he's a senior physical therapist at the University of Alberta. 
a hospital in Edmonton. So he's going to um, give us uh, from the North American context and particularly Canada. And then we move on to um, Dr. Martin Degela from Kenya. Dr. Martin Degela is a senior physiotherapist at the Mediheal Hospital in Kenya. So we'll have uh, from the African context or the continent, um, uh, and up, uh, we'll have some, um, he's going to be representing that. And then we have Miss uh, um, uh, the um, Nourishmiya Murad, who is again a senior physiotherapist from the uh, Ensen Wellness Center. And I think, if I remember right, uh, Nourishman, you yes. dealing with uh, be, be, uh, babies. infants, babies, is that what you said? Yes, saying? babies, okay. infants yeah. and toddlers, yes. Yes, very good. So that's uh, um, from Malaysia. So she's coming in from Southeast Asia. So we had, uh, today we are here having um, the deliberations from all over the world and together united in, in solidarity and cooperation. I now hand it over to uh, Mary Matthew, Professor Mary Matthew, who will take you on from here. Thank you and over to you, Mary. Thank you, Dr. Russell. And thank you to all our speakers. It was such a beautiful learning experience because I'm a pathologist by profession and to hear uh, the challenges that physiotherapists face, it's really heartening. And uh, 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 before we start our discussion, may I request all our speakers and panelists to please uh, keep their um, videos on so that we don't miss you because there were times we have missed speakers because their video was <laughs> on. So please uh, stay on. And if you can also address the questions that are uh, coming into the chat box when you're free, uh, please uh, feel free to do so. And uh, before we go into the panel discussion, just uh, may I um, ask Professor John, and uh, this is for Professor John and um, Neil. Um, Professor John, um, uh, your talk reminded me of uh, something my geography teacher uh, taught me in school. Um, uh, because I, I was basically a very uh, pessimistic uh, person. So um, she, uh, she used to tell me, Mary, uh, remember the, uh, the um, optimist made the parachute and the uh, 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 pessimist, what was it? I forgot now. The, um, no, optimist made the plane, I think, yeah, and pessimist yeah, yeah. made the plane. The optimist made the plane and the uh, pessimist, uh, no, the pessimist, uh, pessimists made the parachute. parachute so yeah. what I'd like to say is we can turn every um, op uh, every challenge into an opportunity and take it as a learning experience because challenges will be always thrown at us. And it's uh, we underestimate ourselves that uh, uh, we are actually quite resilient when it comes to challenges. And as teachers in the profession, in the health profession, we are called to be resilient and be an example for our students. And it's really amazing, uh, Professor John, that you have brought in your student to share his difficulty because students have faced the brunt of this uh, pandemic. A lot of learning has been lost uh, because they do not have contact with, um, uh, with the patients. And um, it's really, um, uh, it has been difficult, at least for my students, I've seen that it's not really um, the issue of losing out in terms of learning, but also issues regarding um, mental health and how to stay focused. So these are the problems that are faced. And I want to ask Neil, um, Neil, what was the new learning that you uh, um, uh, um, that came to you, which you never realized you had it in you? Um, like one of the things I was worried about going out was doing telephone assessments. Okay. Um, just not believing I had the skills to be able to, to do that without a person's face to face. Because normally when you're talking to someone, even like now I can see your face, I'm seeing you nod your head, how you're reacting. And I thought the difficulties of doing that on the phone, 
you're not getting to see a, a, the patient's proper reactions and whether they've understood what you've said and yeah, that type of thing. Yeah, so probably you may have had difficulties when the patient actually couldn't communicate to you. Like you said, there was language barrier and mm -hmm. also probably they may have had associated, you know, um, hearing or, uh, you know, verbally unable to express. So that was probably a challenge um, uh, when you were delivering care, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how did you circumvent that, uh, Neil? Well, so what what initially what ended up happening was you, you obviously try to adapt how you communicate. You, you speak a little bit louder. You try to change your question a little bit, which was part of the skills that I actually enjoyed learning. But what event, what happened is we, we just had to get them in for a face to face because you, you essentially you can't get the information over the telephone. But then that's an issue because the patients waited so many weeks to get a telephone appointment. And then they haven't to wait another five or six weeks to get a face to face, um, which, which really, if the, if, if the communication was better over the phone, we might not have had to have had them wait again. Okay, but did you feel cheated that you never had, uh, uh, you know, the experience of uh, dealing with a patient? Do you feel confident enough to uh, uh, exercise your craft now? Yeah, I, I did think that I was missing out on a lot of manual therapy, but I think that type of thing, I can practice that at home with my friends, my family. I can practice it with other students at the university. Okay. I, got this, I got a lot of the subjective skills on the phone and how to, asking the right questions to try and get the right diagnosis, which I think was more important. Okay. So it, it, there was challenges, but there was opportunities as well. So, yeah. I think if I can come in there, I... We're very fortunate at the University of Sunderland that we're, we're involved with a, a, a patient care, a public involvement group, which is a service user group. So these are people, real patients with long term conditions that are linked to the university. And so we can bring those people in and work with the students so you can kind of slow interactions down develop communication skills which we do a lot of in year one for example um, but also have experience of people I think Neil will remember we did a, an online interprofessional workshop um, so there was a little bit of practice around that where we had physiotherapy students working with medical students pharmacy students nursing students and so on um, with one of the service users they were in their home on their laptop so we were able to get some practice around that and also get a feel for what it was like to undertake a remote assessment you know and, yes. and get people doing things like a timed up and go <laughs> test and things like that um, I mean it, and because it's you get that space I mean the term I always use um, is around front stage backstage um, it's a it's a little bit like being out in practice is front stage you know you're out there doing your doing the job if you like as a student but backstage there are opportunities and we had practical workshops going on on campus for the pretty much the whole of covid with the you know appropriate ppe and social distancing and so on um, and working in small bubbles so that um you know, students, that sort of backstage work where people get to sort of slow up, you know, really slow down and get to practice and firm up on their skills before they go out into practice is very much a flavor of the, the program. And so, again, as with the presentation today, um, I, I kind of a bit of a philosophy around our program is around co-production. So, you know, we work with the students, we work with service users to develop the program and the teaching that that goes into that teaching and learning that goes into that because I think a lot of this the remote working and remote education this isn't new it's something that's been on the way over the past five to ten years and as we mentioned within our presentation it, it's just become a lot quicker now <laughs> it's sort of speeded up um, you know and the innovations and changes around the software zoom and Microsoft Teams and so on, the rapid amount of change in that is phenomenal, really. Um, and I think that on the other side, um, 
to go down the parachute line has caused a lot of stress for people, you know, um, and impacted on people's mental health and their well-being. And thank yeah, you. That's true. Thank you, Professor Stephen. I'll, I'll move on to uh, thank you, Neil, for your contribution. There are a lot of students here asking questions. You can see that in the chat box. So if you'd like, you can also respond to that. Um, uh, Professor Marco, Professor Marco is from Hong Kong. Um, yes. Professor Marco, are you there? Yeah, yes. it's really um, uh, wonderful that you had this hybrid uh, education, which uh, which act actually helped uh, the students uh, to continue their learning. Um, was it a difficult experience for the teachers? Uh, it was very difficult in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, there was because, a lot. Because uh, yeah. not uh, some. What we have experienced is that senior faculty faculty do have challenges in terms of technology and they're not mm. willing to change. So um, I'm, I'm uh, wondering whether, it, was it the same, you know, in Hong Kong? Um, I have to say it's pretty much the same. <laughs> so this is one of the challenges. Okay. Yeah, so using um, this online platform is a challenge for some of the more um, senior people perhaps, mm -hmm. because, um, um, you know, when you go back to the traditional face-to-face, uh, clinical placements, you know, you know, these Zoom platform uh, was not in the picture. But yes. now everything goes completely online and it was one of the challenges, definitely. But, and there was a uh, lot you, of preparation work. Yeah, but do you think, uh, but is there a high acceptance now? It's high acceptance now. It's like the new norm. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. For the that's, students, that's right. for the clinical educators, it's like the new normal for us. So oh. it's getting much better now. Yeah, for oh. sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Marco. Uh, Professor Gopal, uh, I think there's a question here from uh, one of our Indian students where you can see that uh, they're not happy with the online learning. Um, yeah. she, uh, I think uh, just one moment, I'll read it out to you. Mm -hmm. I'm a physiotherapy final year student, undergraduate student. I'm facing problems due to COVID pandemic despite online classes that was not sufficient to learn. Uh, clinical skills and hands-on hands intervention, which is vital for physiotherapy in future. What are the solutions for uh, for that to learn effectively and efficiently? Uh, so, actually, in the challenges, I was addressed the same issue. So mm -hmm. it was identified by the student community earlier. So what uh, we started following is like uh, we, uh, you know, fragment the batches into a small group. And there was a gap between the lockdown and uh, the, the second wave. Uh, we just switched all the uh, you know the online classes into practical demonstrations meanwhile like uh, we created a clinical scenarios like uh, you know the 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 yeah. patient clinical scenarios and we extracted questions from there like uh, uh, to test the analytical skills problem solving and also you know critical thinking skills that was uh, that can be incorporated through through context based uh, questions Okay. And also video demonstrations and we have a clinical skills lab, we have a high and low fidelity mannequins. We used to perform procedures on the mannequins and we used to take video clips and, uh, you know, circulate it to the student community to understand the procedures. Yeah, but yeah. I, I, feel, I, I can feel for, for the student who said that because unless you have the hands-on experience, yes. you feel, like I said before, you feel cheated. That you Definitely, because, yeah. uh, you know, the touch uh, uh, as like... Uh, uh, Neil, uh, student uh, Mr. Neil uh, expressed his, uh, you know, this disappointment of uh, human touch. Uh, when we practicing particularly mobilization techniques, uh, there are uh, grades of mobilization and oscillation techniques, but uh, those kind of uh, techniques, we can't able to make it in online or video clips. And uh, that should be emphasized once uh, this particular, uh, you know, pandemic is uh, resumed, like uh, once they come back to the college. And we have to reschedule those uh, those kind of techniques, uh, you know, in one-to-one -one teaching. That, that's yeah. better way. But India has a very unique problem in terms of the large number, the population, and the care that is to be given. Uh, I'm sure a lot of uh, patients would have lost out uh, in uh, care, and uh, probably not got adequate care. And because uh, there was a complete lockdown, uh, probably even, uh, you know, when it, came to physiotherapists going for home care, that yes. would have been very difficult uh, for them. Professor Gopal? 
Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Uh, uh, because uh, particularly during second wave, uh, there there was no national based lockdown, but uh, the majority of states, uh, you know, undergone uh, lockdown for more than three months. And uh, the, during that time, even we also had many phone calls from the patient community, those who need particularly pain management and palliative care. So those kind of patients, actually, for follow-up, we addressed uh, properly, but new cases, that was the difficult to, to address the physiotherapy services. But follow-up was followed through telephonic conversation or tele-rehabilitation. They can able to change the frequency of uh, management or whatever so. But uh, the new cases, but there may be there may have been patients who couldn't call or afford a phone. Did you experience that kind of situation where they couldn't phone you? Or... Yeah, definitely, definitely. Some of the patients they don't have an internet facility yes. or uh, you know not like uh, particularly the the rural sector. Yes. And the student used to visit uh, often for community rehabilitation to the rural sector. So that was completely interrupted. And uh, for for few months now, uh, you know, students start coming. Particularly, we just allow the vaccinated vaccinated okay. students to come back to the college and uh, clinical services. That will be resumed. And the, whatever uh, patient, uh, you know, they ask whatever need of the patient, that will be addressed very shortly. Yeah. No, I, I just a last question uh, before I go to our uh, panelists. Uh, you probably would have to have uh, uh, modify the theses for many of the students. Um, who are doing research would have been very difficult and the thesis I'm sure would have to be modified. Yes. Um, so how did you, I mean, did you change the topics altogether or did you just? Uh... Uh, no, actually, uh, first phase one, like uh, those who selected uh, experimental study design, and those students was felt, you know, very difficult to get the, the samples, samples yeah. or patient samples. And we advised uh, them to change the, the research design and the main switch to systematic analysis and meta-analysis. So such kind of uh, research so design it, uh, was It required a change. Them. Yeah, yes. Required definitely. a change. Because, uh, you. you know, the pandemic, almost a student uh, community was not, uh, you know, come to the college past one and a half years. That's a huge yes. uh, duration. And uh, particularly, particular batches, particularly second year, was advised to do such kind of, uh, you know, the design change, and uh, okay. maybe in future could be resumed. Thank you, uh, Professor Gopal. Okay. Uh, we'll now go on, uh, move on to our panelists. Um, uh, can I ask uh, Dr. Martin? Dr. Martin is from Kenya. Uh, Dr. Martin, um, uh, you can unmute yourself. Can you unmute yourself? Okay. Dr. Martin? Uh, can you unmute yourself? I'm just checking that. One, just one check. second. I, I just a minute. Yeah, please try now. Dr. Martin, you should. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Martin, uh, you're, you're in Kenya probably. Um, how was the situation there in terms of? Uh, uh, access to care, and I don't know if you're involved in education also. Um, oh, was it the same like in India, or was it uh, you had a different experience? Okay, uh, I will say good evening. Here in okay. Kenya, it's uh, evening, okay. and uh, in Kenya, the access to healthcare was slightly affected. So, and uh, I work in clinical areas, and uh, that is where we had a lot of challenge. One, there was phobia, not uh, due to facilities, but many patients, they fear coming to hospital. Yeah, and getting an infection. Yes, so that was the main uh, phobia that was there. Secondly, also the access to healthcare become, became a challenge because of the resources that were supposed to be there. Like you find, for example, the... PPEs or even the gloves for other medical facilities, it became a challenge because there are those that we were importing that were not manufactured locally. So it became scarce in a way. So it reached a point that even access to healthcare became a challenge. So uh, lately we find that when we faced, there was a surge of the cases, we find that the, even the healthcare providers, they were overwhelmed. So we became less. So we find that a ratio of patient to 
healthcare provider became overwhelmed and it became a challenge. There was a point even the government was a almost challenge. It was forced to employ other healthcare providers so that they can ease that. So healthcare, access to healthcare became a challenge here in Kenya. And uh, at one point, some of the colleagues who are working even in other countries like Uganda, which are neighboring, so they could give also the reports that it's almost similar, that they were okay. really overwhelmed. Mm. All right. Uh, but, uh, did you uh, deliver um, care through telemedicine? Was it possible? Okay, right now there is one that is, uh, it is being delivered, but it is not uh, widely accepted. It's just speaking right now, like it is in major cities, like for example, in Nairobi, our major city is where it's picking up. So it's not something that has been accepted okay. very much due to the challenge of technologies and such. So uh, internet access must be a problem even in the rural areas, right? Yeah, a major challenge. So major you find that, for example, internet connection, it's only in major towns and major cities. Yes. When you go in the interior part, it is very difficult, even access to the technology itself. For example, the these uh, instruments like phones and oh. uh, laptops, yeah, it's scarce. It's only the few that they can have. Did you, because uh, which phase of lockdown, uh, which phase uh, uh, of uh, the wave uh, is uh, Kenya in now? Uh, right now, I think uh, the third phase is going down. So we are yeah. almost facing. Uh, so you probably will be seeing patients now, more patients are coming in. Yeah, in fact, even in my facility where I'm working currently, we are having more patients, like many patients are coming right now. But like in, an outpatient. It's funny. in a bad, uh, you know, in a bad shape or are they okay? I mean, did you lose patients by in any way? So not very bad. Uh, like we find that during the, when the phase was uh, high or when we had the surge, the patient's uh, attendance was low. But right now we are seeing many patients, like for example, in outpatient facility, we used to see maybe roughly 20 patients, 15, but right now we are seeing more than that. So okay. meaning patients, they have uh, accepted, they have, they have got to learn how to deal with Yeah, yeah, the acceptance has come and they're yeah, seeking sure. care now, yeah. Sure. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Martin. Um, uh, Dr. Praveen, uh, Dr. Praveen is the Dean from Gulf uh, Medical University in UAE. Dr. Praveen, Good evening, I think uh, you can see the, uh, a lot of questions from the students. They're very distressed. You are the Dean in, uh, in uh, Allied yes, Health, I presume. Yes. 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 Uh, uh, thank you very you? much, uh, yeah. all the audience. I've been seeing your questions. Uh, basically, this pandemic has actually brought out the students and we really came to know the interest in the students. All these years, we were trying to understand that the students lack interest, but this pandemic actually, when we made the classes online or when the initial days when the pandemic was, uh, when the clinical sessions were canceled, we had uh, two way problems. Even the patients who were uh, seeing the students being active and talking to them on a day-to-day -day basis, the moment they realized that the students are not coming, they almost went into a type of distress that there is nobody to talk with them. That was a big challenge which we had to make. What we did is, uh, as per the restrictions of the possibility here, uh, we have made uh, our practical sessions into multiple small groups. We have opened up and uh, there are a lot of areas or the timings in a day which were not used, which means in the late evening sessions or over the weekends. Uh, as a faculty, we did realize that this is going to be extra burden on the uh, faculty, but uh, there have been implementation of compensatory strategies. But the ultimate goal was the students should realize and should understand that learning is important. The most important thing which we try to inculcate in this part of the country or in our university at least is that we literally went on to say that uh, this, this generation of students is lucky uh, to see what is the meaning of a pandemic even right in their student life. Okay. Because for most of us, uh, a situation of a pandemic was what we learned from textbooks. Uh, what has been done was documented in the history. But these students were encouraged to come on to day-to-day -day practice. Uh, of course, we were uh, lucky enough that we could provide all the protective measures, the PPE kits, and uh, patients were also encouraged. And as Mr. Uh, Neil, the student told, students have learned the usage of technology 
very much now uh, trying to get case histories uh, so we here we call the patients uh, on to the physical treatment after understanding all the evaluation and completing the analysis on a online interview through the phone call or through the video call and their sessions are only directly to reconfirm what assessment has been done and then the students take over the patient treatment and as i was trying to tell that the motivated students have been hyper motivated now no. uh, uh, they realize that this type of a situation can come to them in any time in their practical life when they start working and uh, we saw very challenging students who were ready to come out on the weekends who were ready to come out on the evening shifts uh, who were ready to take up the challenges because they they, they learned it as a challenge they learned it as a impending challenge which they have to face and yeah. this country is lucky enough that vaccination is in place uh, so we are able to control the situation much better yeah i think uae is quite lucky i mean in yes. that uh, yeah they all uh, you didn't have a shortage of ppe or yes, yes. vaccinations yes yes uh, but uh, dr praveen i want you to address a question there are some very distressed students Uh, who are writing in the chat box i yes, want you to uh, reply and uh, <laughs> console them if not anything i uh, i i did I'm, i am trying to type into the students questions yeah. uh, the basic uh, thing which we all need to understand is that yes time is running out and uh, as we can see in social media will there be a culture of trying to tell that students who graduated in the covid time is there any going to be lacune no there is not going to be any lacune in all these students things are going to open up yes ultimately all of you cannot complete or graduate at a basic level or after completing a bachelor level with all the expert skills which you see your seniors or your highly qualified professionals working i would suggest that all the students at this time of pandemic keep in mind that you get into contact and you get a hold of all the theoretical knowledge which is the basic important thing once your theoretical knowledge is there uh, all the universities from wherever you graduate they are going to provide you facilities if you require if you request them that even after graduation is over one or two months i would like to come and go for undergo for a uh, special or additional uh, training. training i don't think any teacher who is interested in their uh, students to pass out with good knowledge or skill will avoid that or any university will avoid that that's a call the students has to take on them taking up uh, this challenge improve your uh, basic information improve your basic skills which are there rebuild on the information which you have lost in the earlier years and once you graduate even if you are not confident enough go back to your universities take this as an advice advice uh, and at, approach your universities that you want to get in for more training and all the universities will be more than happy to do that there is nothing to panic and all of you are entering into your careers only in the fresh years which could be possible any time it does not mean that because of the pandemic you are losing learning even if pandemic was not there those who did not want to learn they did not learn so take this as a challenge is what i would like to tell all the graduating students yeah so because i like the way what neil said he said uh, uh, he practiced the techniques on his friends and his family isn't that what you said neil yeah so neil it is yes yes practice yes. with friends family or the students yeah. so if you really want to learn there are ways of learning and that's really a nice uh, uh, exp- uh, what neil had said so i think for the students please uh, you can t- uh, you're not going to lose out um, uh, like uh, professor praveen said that uh, take it as a challenge or, or take it as an opportunity to learn more so thank you dr praveen thank you so much thank you very uh, much uh, can i uh, ask uh, uh, dr alison Dr. Allison yes. is from uh, Brazil. Uh, Dr. Allison, you've been waiting uh, very patiently, uh, listening uh, to uh, you know the problems of physiotherapists across uh, the globe. What is the experience there in uh, Brazil? Yes, here in Brazil we we have some regi- regions that are very unequal. In small yeah. cities, we have physical therapists. that don't have good training in small in, in bigger cities we have physiotherapists with big trains specialties even in respiratory care okay. in brazil we are um, about uh, more than 250000 uh, physical therapists but in respiratory care we are a very small group so because 
uh, respiratory therapy is very, very specialized. So we had this problem in Brazil during the pandemic. Yeah, so um, uh, other than uh, the lack, I mean, or the less number of physiotherapists, what are the challenges that you face? Did the patients have access to care? Yes, um, in public health, you have uh, many uh, less physiotherapists. So the massive population don't have access to uh, specializing therapy, you know. Uh, in private care, in, hosp in private hospitals, uh, is about 10% or 15% of population has a better service, uh, good physiotherapists, uh, specializ uh, with uh, um, specializing uh, every day with training, training, and training. And this uh, in private hospital, they have a, a better service. Better service, yeah. But were yes. you was uh, telemedicine used uh, to deliver care? Yes, use more telemedicines to train other physical therapists. You know. Uh, even patients too, like the, the other physio, physiotherapist he, that spoke he, uh, here, but uh, we train in our hospital, you deliver more time training others physiotherapists in respiratory care. Okay. Because, como, uh, because in small cities, they have many, many problems with mechanical ventilation, they don't. They didn't know how to do with patients with critical care. Uh, they don't know how to proceed in weaning of mechanical ventilation. Mm -hmm. They didn't use uh, non-invasive mechanical ventilation. Okay, uh, because um, uh, Professor Gopal, uh, you had said um, that the students were not allowed to give um, physio chest physiotherapy. Is that what you said? No, no, no. Uh, uh, I'm not uh, saying like uh, chest physiotherapy is. It's not a highly specialized no. skill, but applying uh, ACBT AD in the sense like uh, active cycle of breathing technique that was uh, that can be done with uh, you know postgraduate student community, but particularly those who are involving in intensive care unit. Okay. Those students, uh, I I would like to suggest to go for ACL ACLS training also because. You know, many algorithms are there to manage uh, the emergency situations. Okay. So if, if they know all the algorithms or scenarios, it will be a better way to understand what kind of emergency it is. There okay, are okay. shockable rhythm, non-shockable rhythm, we have many, many, many scenarios are there. So okay. I would like to suggest all the student community, those are involving in patient care, better to go with the BLS as well as ACLS training courses. Okay. All right, uh, I'm going back to uh, Dr. Allison. Um, Dr. Allison? Yes. Yeah, so um, uh, you don't train students, is it? Is that yes. what you- Yes, we don't train students. So only, only those who, only professionals, okay. Yes. So um, did um, Brazil have enough uh, supply of PPE for all the physiotherapists or did that, was that a problem? Was vaccination a problem? Yes, we don't have, uh, like I, I said, we don't have sufficient professional vaccination here is a problem because the, uh, in the beginning, uh, we start vaccination in January 7th, okay. um, 17th. And we start with professionals of uh, healthcare. Okay. But uh, we uh, sometimes uh, we have many problems with the manager, all, okay. <laughs> all problems with vaccinations, professional health, and the, the critical care in our patients around okay. the Brazil. So uh, is it getting better, Dr. Allison, or is the, is the situation in Brazil getting better? Yes, better. Uh, today, today, we spare uh, in the... Uh, worst time of pandemic, we have 4,000 deaths in 24 hours. Today, we have 1,000 deaths in 24 okay. hours. We have uh, about 
uh, 18 million recovered here okay. in Brazil. And this is our, our numbers. Okay, so it's getting better. So probably you'll see more and more patients coming in for care. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Allison. I'll uh, move on to Ms. Uh, Norisima. I'm very yes. eager to, uh, because yes, your, your speciality is a little different and more challenging, I feel, because you take care of uh, uh, babies and toddlers. Now, um, yes. what, uh, uh, can you tell us what were the challenges that you faced? Okay, thank you so much. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you for uh, inviting me uh, in becoming the, one of the least uh, panelists global uh, in this 44th international webinar conference. Okay, um, first of all, um, I would like to address the current situation in uh, my country, Malaysia. Today only, we have uh, remarked a total of uh, 1 million cases um, of COVID-19 um, suffered from the virus. Lah. And then, um, but uh, a part of that, we are already at the, um, we already have around 80, uh, sorry, 844,000 uh, 844, of recovered cases. Okay. However, we are already in the third, almost fourth wave of this uh, pandemic yep. uh, in country. So there are a stricter uh, authorization from the government. Hence, um, only certain sections, uh, only certain uh, sectors of um jobs that can be open during this um, movement control order. Uh, apart from that, um, my career as a pediatric therapist or the baby therapist um, kind of affected with this. So um, I didn't manage to uh, attend the session with the kids uh, and the infants and toddler because uh, in my session, uh, I was designated as the therapist in handling the um, hydrotherapy uh, okay. for the infants and toddlers. As we um, facing the direct, contra uh, the direct contact with the uh, kids, um, as you all know that the kids and infants and toddlers are the most fragile. Yeah. <laughs> so they have the lowest uh, immunization. So we are facing um, several challenges in this. But... Um, I would like to address uh, a side of these uh, problems. We can still um, manage to uh, overcome it together with the netizens uh, in order to lower the um, positive cases by <laughs> not, uh, not uh, operating. Okay, Sorry. so uh, probably uh, you, uh, the mothers may, may not have been bringing their children, or mothers or fathers may not have been uh, bringing their children for therapy because there is a question in the chat box that says, one of the physiotherapists said that she, she I think it is a she, um, who said that uh, she's having problems with treating uh, cerebral, uh, children with cerebral palsy. Yeah, true. Sure. Um, because my uh, my job or my, my career lies under the non essential uh, scope, which is not um, the essential one to be operating. So that's uh, hard to uh, tell the parents that are actively uh, sending their children and toddlers uh, to the session that we can't um, progress with the uh, intervention in a proper way. So the, uh, there is a question <laughs> yes, there from uh, Priyanka saying how how to handle children and toddlers with COVID. Or how to handle handle the infants and toddlers? Okay. But, um, wait, no, with COVID, with COVID. With COVID. Okay. okay. So I'm not in the position to uh, explain that because um, uh, I'm not working in the uh, hospital setting. I just work as uh, the um outside uh, which is yeah. uh part of the leisure leisure setting yeah all right uh, okay it's, sorry uh, i would like to answer to that question to the to encourage the student yes uh, the problems with the children and toddlers which are coming because of the covid complications are similar in terms of respiratory complications but the only thing which we have to try and understand is that the parents involvement in teaching the student and teaching the children and making them understand the importance and 
giving the exercises in a playful manner is what which we can try to do so that the parents also become uh, very important in the part of rehabilitation this has also brought out a very important thing earlier the parents or the mother used to always think that i take the pay child to the hospital i pay some amount of money and everything will be taken care now what has happened is the therapist is only becoming as a facilitator and the emphasis is made on the parents so that the contribution in the pay by the parents is become much more and it has uh, been highlighted because of this pandemic yeah but dr praveen uh, you know children uh, children uh, uh, i mean you can make them understand but we are talking about small babies and yes. toddlers that that's really a challenge I'm, that, I'm that sure. is a challenge but as i am trying to tell you uh, better than mother nobody else is there in this world yeah that's true the, that's now we are trying to concentrate on educating the parents and the mother what i was supposed to do as a therapist we are trying to concentrate on educating them so that they can actively involve in the process of uh, rehabilitation yeah thank you dr praveen so narasimha are, are, are you going are you seeing patients now are you seeing uh... um for the past two months i didn't see uh, any patients because we can't be uh, operating in this so movement you, control yeah, order because you're, you're saying you're a non essential service that is really sad yeah that term is yes. very sad <laughs> yeah thank you yes. very much <laughs> Thank you very much. No You're welcome. Time. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, Dr. Olubode. Dr. Olubode is from uh, Alberta Hospital, University of Alberta, uh, Edmonton, Canada. Can you hear yeah. us? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's, uh, You've been waiting very yeah. patiently. You've been waiting That's very okay. patiently. Yeah. That's so okay. Canada probably will have a different scenario, right? Because the facilities are available, I'm presuming. And, yes. Uh, uh, so... So yeah, we've had uh, three waves here so far. Uh, first wave was uh, um, kind of late spring and summer last year, and the second wave was uh, in this in the fall, and then uh, we're just currently coming out of the third wave. So at the beginning, um, you know, uh, COVID pandemic was declared a, a pandemic in March 11th, and then. A couple of days later, the province that I live in, uh, Alberta, declared a, a state of uh, public health emergency March 15th of 2021. And that kind of just plunged everything into disarray. I mean, like um, uh, Professor John Stevens was saying earlier, this is really unprecedented and nobody really knew what to do. No. Uh, so for Allied Health staff, it became, okay, what's gonna be our role? So I work in the hospital at the University Hospital in critical care. So in ICU, I've treated a lot of patients over the years with ARDS, which is basically what patients who come down with uh, COVID-19 typically have. But still, you know, being a pandemic, it kind of just threw the system into disarray and trying to figure out what's going to be the role of uh, physiotherapists in, uh, in managing patients with, uh, with COVID. And most of them were, they were typically on isolation. Uh, so policies were being designed, protocols were being designed, uh, and there was a lot of training on PPE management and PPE use and enforcement across the board. And uh, PTs were being trained with assisting with proning and other procedures like that. We we're also staying away from any aerosol generating procedures uh, because we know that COVID is transmitted via droplets. Uh, so my first experience with a COVID patient was actually uh, about a month and a half into the pandemic, about maybe two months into the pandemic, we had our first patient who actually survived and flipped into the subacute phase. And we quickly started to realize that, you know, this is no different from managing any patient recovering from ARDS. It's just now you have the label of COVID. Uh, but there was a lot of uh, fear from, you know, people dealing with COVID patients, you know, and the fear of, you know, would I contract the disease? And and whatnot, whatnot. Uh, but as as uh, we started to have more and more exposure, uh, people started to understand that this is really not much different. Just have to adhere okay. very strictly to the infection Safety control break. protocols. Uh, and then, yeah, exactly. Uh, and unfortunately in the private sector, um, as soon as the, the uh, public state of uh, emergency was declared, all of the private hospital uh, clinics, I should say, uh, were shut down. Okay. So you have all of this physiotherapist in private care who didn't really have a job. Um, some of them worked in a casual pool in the hospital. So they were able to come in and at least have something to do. 
but a lot of them, the vast majority were just unemployed. And so there was a huge uncertainty um, around that. Uh, luckily, the government gave some uh, financial relief at the federal and the provincial level, at least to help cushion uh, the financial burden that they were now facing. And then back in May of last year, uh, our province started to sort of ease restrictions and clinics could reopen, but they had to reopen with new um, um, protocols in place. Uh, exactly, precautions and pro protocols in place. Um, so they had to do more cleaning. They had to see patients on appointments only basis. They had to uh, allow only a certain number of people within the facility. And obviously everybody had to wear masks, right? So that was a huge change uh, there. So there was also loss in revenue because now you can't see as many patients as you would normally see um, and things like that. And in terms of students, so you had uh, the, the, the um, federal body that uh, kind of manages examination and licensure. They were also obviously affected by this. They had to go to virtual um, mode of learning. With, uh, more, not, not just learning because they administrate exam mm. for licensure. So they had to go to virtual um, administration services. Those could, they encouraged their staff who could work from home to work from home starting in uh, beginning of April, 2020. And then the uh, written exam, they still were able to have a written exam because that was mostly uh, done uh, computer-based. But the clinical exam, they had trouble administering because it was in-person, uh, OSCE exams. So they had to cancel the exams uh, from November. Uh, and also they tried to reschedule in a virtual mode and in March of this just this March of 2021, but they had to cancel that because the virtual system wasn't working. They were having glitches and things. So actually it was very, a lot of the candidates were very distraught and the body had to refund uh, the fees and actually schedule the next exam um, uh, at no cost to them. But unfortunately, even as of now, there still hasn't been any clinical exam. It is a huge backlog. And they're hoping to restart exams, hopefully maybe in September of this year in smaller groups. So change in formats and everything. So there's just been across the board, just you know, huge challenges. And you also have students uh, who at the beginning of the pandemic were still, who those who were placed in hospital were still able to go through their placement, but they had limited amount of exposure because they couldn't see COVID patients. You have those in private clinics because the private clinics were shut down they just couldn't have their placement. So they had to defer their placement. So across the board, it's just been huge challenges. Yeah, thank you. I think you put, uh, you summed up everything, practically every challenge, uh, you know, that uh, physiotherapists face. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Olubode. Uh, I'm you. going to wind up now. So I'm going to ask all our speakers, just a final, uh, um, just final words. Uh, Professor John Stephen, Professor Stephen. Well, thank you very much. Um, can I just say what a, a great pleasure it's been um, to listen to people today, actually. An awful lot of commonality in terms of challenges and opportunities uh, across the globe for the profession. Um, and I think I would like to finish just by encouraging the students, really. Yeah, <laughs> obviously, true. I mean, they're, so they're the future. Yeah, yeah, they're the future of the profession. Um, yeah. And obviously, things change, um, you know. And I think a, a great sort of a, I don't know, a, a saying that I'm familiar with, anyways, hasten slowly, you'll soon arrive. It's this idea, you know, there's no need to rush, you know, there's always space to learn um, if you want to create it. So, can I wish all the students very best wishes in their future careers? Thank you, Thank Professor Stephen. Neil, you are the poster boy for uh, for the students. <laughs> so your final words of wisdom to them. Neil, are you there? Yeah, to, to all the students, I, it has been very difficult. I, I've had a difficult year with stress and all of the workload and problems with placements and stuff. But... I think you've got, we'll talk about earlier, you've, you've got to seek your own opportunities. 
You can't expect to be taught everything off your clinical educators. You can't, everything the university's done for us, I can't expect them to teach us everything. It's up to me to pick up a book and read it in your own time. Like I say, learn whenever you can with whoever you can. So take the opportunities to learn yourself and rather than concentrate on the negatives of the situation, concentrate on the positives and what very, opportunities very. can you find within it. Yeah. Neil, you're such a wise man. That's all <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Neil. Pro um, Professor Gopal, any uh, last words? Yes, ma'am. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to attend such kind of uh, presentations. Thank uh, you. Uh, there was a lot of inspiring, uh, you know, words uh, and, uh, you know, inspiring ideas uh, from Dr. Praveen, Dr. Russell about uh, and to motivate the student community particularly. Even this many of uh, Neil is really great. And uh, of course, I wholeheartedly accept a self-directed learning because what they learn in college is uh, like a pinch of sand. But uh, they have to develop themselves uh, to, to, to seek, uh, you know, self-learning uh, facilities. And uh, we already, you know, in, uh, like introduced uh, PDL, CBL, so such kind of uh, education in online mode. So that helps more uh, to understand the clinical uh, aspect of uh, patient care. So yeah. it was very interesting. Uh, I'm really, you know, appreciate all the speakers. I also learned, uh, you know, many, many, many ideas. The COVID is not end because we are approaching third wave. So whatever we learn here, we can able to incorporate in future. Yeah. So thank so you all so stepping much. Stepping up to the challenges. Yes, thank yes, you very much. Thank you. thank you, Professor Marco. Your, um, your final words. Yes. Of yes. Wisdom. It's been yeah, <laughs> I'm not too sure about that, but uh, it's been a real pleasure um, being able to take part in this uh, international platform, um, get to hear so many different stories uh, from different speakers and uh, guests, and it's been wonderful. And I know there are a lot of um, students here attending. And um, like what the other speakers have said, um, it's been a very stressful year for the students. Um, but I think this COVID-19 pandemic has also brought um, a lot of opportunities, learning opportunities, because I think one of the major things that physio students should be trained to do is problem solving skills. Okay. okay? Because, you know, we cannot teach students everything and problem solving skills, critical thinking skills, they are very important. And I think, you know, with this pandemic, definitely, um, you know, it, it's teaching us how to problem solve. Yes. We need to come up with new solutions. We need to exactly. be innovative and learning is a lifelong process. So yes. I think, yes, it is it, it's a crisis, but it, it has also brought along many learning opportunities. And I think we should, you know, try to, um, you know, learn as much as we can, you know, through this um, crisis, I think. Thank you very um, much, Professor Mark. All the best. Yeah, all the Thank best, you. because I don't know, you know when this pandemic is going to be over. <laughs> so, yeah, yes, um, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Marco. Um, Dr. Martin? Is Dr. Martin there? Are you mute? You're yes. mute. Oh, yeah, there you go. Okay, uh, I can say it has been an interesting session, uh, learning and hearing from different continents and different people. All I can say is that uh, COVID-19 has changed the world and it has brought a, a lot of changes. So that is the way we approach things, the way we do things has changed. And uh, even if we go deep and look into it, we find a lot of ethical issues that are there. Yeah. That, that, that does not mean that we stop maybe learning or giving our services. So all I can say that uh, from all this, that we can find new techniques, new ways of doing things. To the students, I remember the university where I studied, we used to use problem-based learning and student-directed learning. So I think this, is, this COVID put us into a practical perspective of how to do these things. So we can encourage more of trying to look into issues from problem solving. And uh, by that, we can gain a lot. And then at the same time, uh, that uh, it's good to bring all our efforts together. And at the end, we can achieve it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Martin. Uh, 
Dr. Praveen, I think uh, everyone's looking up to you because you're the dean. Uh, yes, thank you very much all for uh, such a wonderful organizing committee and invited speakers across the world. As you can see, all of us, either whether it is a developed country or an undeveloped country, all of us are facing the same situation. Yeah. The most important thing which I as a dean has realized is that this has brought out the very innovative approaches from the students' behalf. Many of the students come up trying to tell that, sir, we want to learn it in this way. We want you to learn teachers in this way. And as we can see, uh, 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 Dr. Derek and uh, Dr. Russell, Dr. John have already put in the chat box that it's a responsibility of all the teaching organizations to open up the avenues for learning okay. where uh, internet or learning through media is becoming more common nowadays and all we as faculties should encourage these things by making video clippings, by making informative sessions, organizing more CME activities. This is going to be the new norm where everybody will become uh, used to search which is the next CME I want to attend, which is the next. Earlier, attending a conference was difficult, traveling all the way, spending a lot of money. Now, things have become very easy. You can sit in a restaurant, you can sit in your uh, living area. So this is the big change which is brought about. Any student who is motivated to learn, I'm sure from my experience, will search out the ways how he wants to achieve his target. Uh, we as professionals, teachers, we are all here. You can communicate with us, you can talk to us, you can email us. As responsible people, we'll all be there to support you at all given times. Uh, even after the pandemic goes, as I have typed in the messages, Actually, this pandemic has brought good to the physiotherapy profession because many surgeries which are non-essential have been put on hold by the authorities and they have been referred for non-interventional uh, inter methods of management like rehabilitation. Okay. Now the patients have realized that why was I supposed to go for a surgery when I'm getting so much better results with the rehabilitation? So this is the positive aspect of the profession where we're able to learn. People are coming to us by themselves. People are ready to come at any given time of an appointment. So these are the good things which I have learned in this pandemic. I request all the students to be positive. Things will be good and we will all sail through this and all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Praveen, spoken like a true dean. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison, your a few words. Dr. Allison, you yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I would like to thank for the great live session with, with uh, and we can hear about um, other experiences. And uh, here in Brazil, we are now um, more um, uh, helpfulness with the, the pandemic situation. And we whisper and I would like to to give my hugs for all of you and health for all of you and continue uh, studying and innovation is the best thing for us today. Thank you, Dr. Allison. I hope Brazil comes out of this pandemic too without much uh, losses. Thank you very much. Ms. Norisima? Yes. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Matthew. So, uh, as to wind up, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the committee for this live session. It's such a fruitful session that I gained so much uh, information from this. Uh, I would like to say, as an autonomous profession, we uh, handle the, um, I would say, like the most uh, responsibility in order to overcome um, the long COVID. Um, especially because we need to regain back our pre-COVID quality of life as long as uh, we can overcome this together for the globally. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so thank much. you so much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Norsima. Uh, uh, Dr. Olabade, I'm sorry. I'm, it's tongue twisting for okay. me. <laughs> sorry. That's no, okay. That's okay. Um, yes, thank you very much for having me today. This has truly been uh, educational and sensational. Like I've learned so much. It's good to see the shared perspective and shared challenges that we all face. Uh, and I totally, truly agree with uh, uh, all the panelists that uh, this is an uh, opportunity for innovation. Uh, I also tend to, in addition to being a clinical uh, uh, therapist, I also uh, 
uh, in the private sector, I'm involved in training and coaching uh, international graduate uh, therapists trying to get licensed in Canada. And I've, I've been doing this for over 10 years. And I realized in the last year, the huge amount of opportunity in tele rehab and tele learning and virtual learning that I've been doing a lot because I couldn't meet with any of my clients in person. And so, I mean, there's always all sorts of opportunities to use the technologies that we have at our disposal uh, for learning purposes. And so I want to encourage all the students out there who are thinking that this is, you know, a, a depressing time and that there is always opportunities to learn. And she's taken upon yourself to be innovative about uh, using the technologies at your disposal for learning. Thank you very much. Very, very um, encouraging words for everyone, not only for the students, but also to the practicing uh, physiotherapists. So with that, um, I'd like to thank all the panelists and the speakers for a wonderful session. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm, like I said, a pathologist by profession, but uh, I, I seem to understand now what, uh, what the physiotherapy profession is going through. So I hope all of you stay safe and you continue the good work that uh, you all are doing. And it's really been a pleasure having you on this webinar. So with these words, I'd, uh, uh, maybe I'll give it to uh, uh, Dr. Russell. Would you like to say a uh, close yes, session? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Mary, uh, for that um, the last session on uh, taking us, um, uh, taking the discussion through giving us a global picture. And I want, uh, you, uh, I think one of the important things, all of you would agree, that uh, this has been an important part of our solidarity and cooperation. I think all of you have noted that uh, you came together from all over the world. And what we've learned is all, uh, as uh, Praveen had said, Dr. Praveen, uh, developing or no developing, whatever you are, wherever we are, all are in it together and that that's article 13 of the universal declaration on bioethics and human rights uh, brings this important aspect of uh, solidarity and cooperation uh, which is um, what we try to do and we have certainly been bringing this bring the world together as it were in uh, each of these disciplines one of the important things from this is we did have uh, two earlier, and this is th the third one. And I think uh, I'll be with, with um, Dr. Uh, Vishnu Devi and John and others. We would like, we did this with pharmacy, with nursing, and so forth. What you've come out from here, coming out with the um, ethical, uh, some guidelines. And this is a wonderful uh, opportunity because all of you. Uh, uh, Dr. Russell, a uh, white paper on. on, on, on yeah. Yes, that's the white paper on uh, we on the ethical uh, you know guidelines in, in a pandemic. Some of the things that you all have spoken about coming across, not only in the clinical aspect, but from the, the education for students and so forth. So I'm going to get that. Um, we had two. And this is the third, and usually we do that. So we will try to get that, and it will be published in the indexed International Journal of the UNESCO Chair, which is the Global Bioethical Inquiry. So we'll have that. I'm sure all of you would be um, happy to be uh, the authors of this white paper, which, which I think you would not, because we have uh, uh, all of you from different parts. So we had this discussion, we've had two, and we might have, after we bring this out, we might have a, uh, uh, might have another opportunity to come together to look at that part, reviewing that. Is that something that you think uh, we did that um, uh, with all the other disciplines? And so I would be keen to have this also published uh, in the Global Bioethical Inquiry um, uh, uh, a white paper. Um, um, anyone, uh, are you all happy about it? You think that's a good idea? Uh, the, Professor Pang and Professor John and uh, all the others, uh, Praveen and Go, uh, Dr. Gopal, we might get you to take this uh, uh, forward. It's an excellent idea, sir. We'll yeah. work on it. It's, it's a really good idea, sir, of course. Uh,
and particularly having uh, the authors from around the world, uh, from yes. the teaching institutions, from private uh, clinical practice and so forth, that will make it um, um, so we'll we'll work on that. I'll send off the note. We'll have uh, some of, uh, some of you taking this as we've done with all the others. Okay, so it uh, that's one important, very important because uh, this very uh, very rarely you'll get an opportunity to have a platform that brings all of you from all the continents uh, virtually here together. Um, in fact, we should have had. Uh, um, Dr. Um, Dania, she was not well from, Mil from, she was there last time from Australia. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Neela Mishra, uh, who's, uh, no, yes, who is, who takes the role of, um, uh, of the, uh, looking at uh, um, um, biotics and the allied health sciences for our Chifad International Chair. And of course, um, Vishnu Devi, Dr. Vishnu Devi, who is the national um, uh, head of the bioethics and physiotherapy bioethics unit as well. So with this, I, I um, sincerely thank each and every one of, particularly the uh, of you who have taken all the time, your, the three very distinguished speakers who set the scene as it were, and then the other distinguished international panel who brought so much of uh, uh, information and knowledge uh, uh, to this meeting. And, uh, <laughs> Dr. Russell, I think Dr. Yeah. Deborah from Brazil. Yes, I, I, I wanted to uh, acknowledge many of our yeah. colleagues are here from who come in from, and where Dr. Deborah is. Yeah, she was here, no? Deborah from, yeah, this uh, Deborah from. Again, uh, Dr. Al where is uh, Alison? Dr. Alison Hitler, we have on our committee Deborah, also from uh, Carol Hanty from uh, Brazil. She is on our committee. We also have, unfortunately, he's not here, another dear uh, Dr. Uh, Lincoln, Lincoln Lopez. Right. He usually comes, uh, who's from Brazil, who's the President of the Confederation of uh, Medical Associations of Latin America and Caribbean. He's also on this committee. But um, so, uh, welcome to uh, an acknowledgement to you and to uh, Dr. Arun Mehta, uh, Mira, uh, Mira, and many others who, I, uh, who are here. Uh, we acknowledge and thank you all for your um, uh, contribution. I think we had a very good, we had a large number, 400, I think, went to 490. And there's other, the, it's also being live streamed by Derek on YouTube, or no, on YouTube or Facebook or so. YouTube, isn't it, Derek? YouTube, yeah. sir, and we still have 350 plus people yeah. with here. We had a very interesting discussion parallel in the chat box. Mm -hmm. And uh, my thanks to all the panelists who not only posted a lot of relevant information, links, PowerPoints, and overall, I think the needs of the students where they were just looking for some encouragement that they are not alone. I know it's very depressing. I know there were a lot of lacunae in their education that they feel, but I think our poster boy Neil, so hats off to you for that wonderful line of learn wherever you can and when you can. I think that line is going to be the tagline for all the physiotherapy students. They're going to take a lot of encouragement from that. So thank you for sharing that. And of course, Dr. Praveen and all the other teachers, Dr. Gopal gave them so much encouragement that everyone, the whole profession is aware of this. So we are going to face the challenges. We are going to help you in future. So don't feel despondent. Don't feel that you lack anything. And I told you, you just have to search for it. You'll find the information. When we are faced with challenges, we find innovation. When a new infection comes and we find a new vaccine. So as you find difficulty in your training, it will force you to think better. It will force you to come up with a new method of training. And that is what progress is all about. So thank you once again. And thank you all the panelists. The students are extremely grateful. There's a lot of positivity coming in from where we started. Maybe a little bit of uh, negative emotions were there. Maybe a little bit of... Uh, depression or despondency, but I think that has changed to a total feeling of positivity, 
they're able to understand that uh, they are not alone. We are all there. So thank you, everyone, for giving them that hope. And thank you for making this really a wonderful webinar. So thank you all once again. I also want to acknowledge, uh, acknowledge Dr. I can see Dr. Monica, uh, who was our last uh, speaker of the last uh, 43 uh, from Wisconsin, who uh, gave an excellent talk on the immunology and the vaccines. Thank you. I can acknowledge uh, Dr. Russell, uh, I think Dr. Deborah wanted to say something. Deborah? Yes, Dr. Good. Deborah, please. Yes. <laughs> Good day for all. I just want to thank you, uh, all of you, for this excellent uh, webinar and say that Dr. Derek said all the things that uh, I want to say. It was, it's very important for the students, this kind of sections. Thank you. Congratulations for Dr. Alison. He's from my state, he's from Paraiba too. And I want to you that be safe and well this week. Thank you very much to be part of this group. Thank you, Deborah, and for being there. Uh, and I'm delighted to tell you that we virtually had, as you could see, uh, we, uh, we started at that time because that's uh, the mountain time. So we've had, uh, uh, besides uh, the mountain from, um, uh, from Edmonton, we also had from USA, from Wisconsin, and that's of course central time. So we had right through the, uh, from, uh, uh, the whole world virtually, uh, we tried, that's where we had this time. For me, it's one o'clock in, in Australia, but we started at 10.30 in the night in Australia, but it starts at 6.30 with your, in the morning with the mountain time in the United States and Canada, and uh, right through. So we've had uh, the world as it were uh, here. So great, great day, a big thanks to uh, uh, Dr. Vishnu Devi, who put a lot of effort into bringing all of you together here on behalf of the, the chair, which uh, she um, heads in terms of bioethics. So we have a big program uh, uh, for the, in ethics teaching and also for students, um, uh, which, which uh, are in, in particularly into uh, applied bioethics in, in, and an integrated bioethics curriculum for the physiotherapy, particularly for physiotherapy. And so we'll have that Dr. Vishnu Dev will show any of you are interested, we'll be, uh, we, uh, we'll, you'll be welcome to take part in our, in our program um, um, that, uh, that uh, we run, particularly uh, for the, we have a physiotherapy program, we have a dental, we have nursing, pharmacy, but physiotherapy and an integrated ethics curriculum based on the Universal Declaration on, on the 15 principles of the Bio Universal Declaration on bioethics and human rights, human dignity and human rights. Uh, so we, if, if you want to know more about it, please contact Dr. Vishnu Devi or myself or Dr. Mary or Derek and uh, the Department of Education does have an international faculty that um, we have a number of courses, particularly for students and for faculty on how to teach uh, a medical humanity in along with the health sciences. So with that, thank you everyone. And we, and we continue in our solidarity and cooperation. We are all in it together and um, we are very confident, uh, optimistically that we'll all come out together uh, from this, as I said, uh, someone was, uh, I think Mark was, so said, we're waiting, when we'll finish, when will we come out of this, right? I think we will come out of it. We are very sure uh, that uh, all of us will come out. Uh, I know it's difficult. Right, right now, Australia, I, I, I'm talking to you from Australia, which was one of the countries that had did very well, but now with the, with the uh, uh, Delta, Half the country is in lockdown at the moment in Australia. Half the population, three states, uh, and half the population, including Melbourne, where I'm, we're all in lockdown at the moment. So there we go. So as Praveen said, developed, not developed, we're all in it together, right? And uh, so once again, thank you. 
and stay safe, stay well. We'll be having the next webinar is going to be bringing together the medical students from around the world on what they've faced. And we hope to have that and we'll send you out. So in, in a fortnight, we'll be seeing having that program. Uh, I think there's a group called medical students against COVID or so. And, but we have the, we have a student program. Um, so we'll be looking at students and, um, and uh, their ability to tell us what, what's happening around the world. So thank you very much once again and bye-bye. Stay safe, stay well. Thank we'll you. meet again. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Vishnu. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well done, Dr. Vishnu. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Gopal. Thank you, ma'am. Bye, Good job, Dr. Bye, Dr. Bye, Dr. Bye, Bye, everyone. Thank you for being here. Bye, Dr. 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 Bye, 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 Thank you. Thank you so I, much, I think sir. one of you, I, I will write and we, we will have this paper. That will be a good thing. So we'll ask, uh, you wanna, I'll get one of you to coordinate or lead this program uh, to have this publication, white paper on uh, the ethics, what we come across, what you all will agree to for physiotherapists in a pandemic. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Bye, Dr. Russell. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye, Bye, -bye Derek. Bye, -bye, Bye, -bye, Bye, Derek. Derek. Bye, Derek. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, 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 Bye,